Well, welcome back to the Armchair Trader podcast. Uh, this week, we're talking about cryptocurrency again. On the show, we have Austin Kim from Choice.com here in the UK. Uh, we've got a number of uh, hot topics in crypto we'll be discussing on this week's episode. But first of all, uh, welcome, Austin, to the podcast. Thank you, Stuart. It's good to be here. Could you give us a quick rundown on Choice.com, the company, and, and what you guys do? It's simpler to say Choice.com is a crypto company banking app, let's say, although we don't have a banking license. But if you just imagine what a bank does with fiat currency, we pretty much do the same with, with digital currency or cryptocurrency. And we set up in 2017, so we've been around quite a long time now in the crypto space anyway. That's, that's quite a long time. And we, when we first set up back in, in 17, no one really knew how to buy crypto, what you could do with it. Um, you know, do you need different wallets for everything, et cetera. So we set about making everything really simple. That was the whole purpose of it. So we didn't go about how to create a platform for traders or how to um, really get into the nitty gritty of how cryptocurrency works. It's a simplified approach to cryptocurrency. Anyone should be able to use our application, open the application and very easily they can buy crypto, they can exchange it, they can swap it, they can open a savings account uh, and so on. So if you just you know, picture your own banking app, that's pretty much what our app looks like, but maybe even simpler than a banking app, I would argue. Do you just deal with clients in the UK or are you, are you dealing with people all over the world? No, actually, I mean, we are a, a global brand. So we, we actually have operations in four or five different countries in terms of where our staff are based, but we service over 170 countries right now. The UK is actually a more difficult market than most. Um, under the name of commercial rapid payment technologies, which is a bit of a mouthful, but that's our, our UK brand. Um, we actually have a registration in the UK and we were one of the first companies to get registration. But the UK's approach to regulation on crypto has been very hard for, for companies to, to comply with. So because the UK still considers itself part of the European Union when it comes to a lot of monetary policy, most companies just service the UK from outside the UK, uh, if that makes sense. You know, they don't actually even try to bother with getting UK regulation. So the UK, we do have a lot of customers in the UK, maybe 5% of our total, but we are pretty much a, a global operation. Well, thanks. As I said, thanks for coming on, on the show today. We've got a number of um, sort of relatively topical um, items we wanted to discuss with you. Um, and the first really is um, I wanted to get your views on Web3 and what is called MetaFi. Can you give us a little bit more flavor on that and, and what your view is of, for the development of, of Web3? Yeah, so I think Web3, MetaFi, Metaverse, um, words used interchangeably, I would say, but they're not actually the same thing, as I'm sure you, you're you know, very familiar with. I think what most people understand to be Web3 is a, a decentralized approach to, to the internet, and it's still going to be primarily on laptops, on mobile phones, and um, it, it's more of a... Uh, I would say a two-way process, whereas the current internet, as we know, there's a, uh, a centralized organization at the other end of the transaction. They control everything. And if you have a problem, you go back to them. And it's, 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 it's a traditional um, business model, whereas Web3, in theory, is more of a, an interactive experience where you have smart contracts determining certain transactions and everything is more automated and you have a bigger say in things. Now, Web3, is more of a concept, I would say, than a reality right now. And the only um, areas I would say that is really trying to grapple with what Web3 could mean is the metaverse. And the metaverse, of course, is heavily connected to blockchain transaction um, technology and, and cryptocurrency transactions. So there's a lot of conferences, a lot of talk, a lot of money being invested by investment funds into what I would call the metaverse which effectively is a use case for Web3 right now. We also coin a phrase called MetaFi, um, which is something in between in that what we see is happening today with cryptocurrency is it's different than it was in 2017. So in 2017, the question was, how do you spend it? How do you buy it? What, what purpose does it have, et cetera? And there was a lot of companies 
bit like cryptiriumnowchoice.com that went out to, to answer that question. And you could say, you know, a quick search on the internet, you'll probably find a hundred companies without too much searching that can probably either give you a, a Visa card or a MasterCard that can spend cryptocurrency. So that question has been answered. Now, the question that seems to be on most people's lips is actually, how do I make money out of cryptocurrency? And this is a, a tricky subject. And this is one of the reasons why the SEC is getting so hot in the area of regulation on cryptocurrencies right now, because they effectively argue that most people are buying cryptocurrency with the intention of making money. And even though the currencies themselves could argue that they are all um, utility tokens and they're not securities, the SEC argues if you enter a transaction with the intention of making some money out of it, it's therefore um, a security. Now, why that's important is that most people actually are getting into cryptocurrency to make money. You know, very few people or very few companies are still actually transacting on a on a daily basis using cryptocurrency for their shopping or or to make a payments. Companies may use um, some cryptocurrency transactions backwards and forwards, but the average person is still not doing that. Um, so if people are getting into it to make money, what we see um, as a metafy is is linking this um, web three environment where there are fantastic opportunities in the decentralized web space for people to make money out of cryptocurrency. But actually it's incredibly difficult to do. Most people go back to the 2017 scenario. Now people don't know what, what is a MetaMask? How do I move from this blockchain to another blockchain? In fact, most people don't even understand that there are different blockchains. You know, there is multiple blockchains with different functions. So for us, a MetaFi was to, to really bring it all together in one environment so that people don't have to worry about what is C5, what is D5, what is this chain, what is that chain? And it's using the Web3 technologies and new innovations that are coming along. Is this something that is going to be able to grow rapidly or, or do you think that there are kind of significant obstacles? You've mentioned the SEC already, um, regulators looking at this kind of thing and trying to decide whether they need to get more involved in regulating you know, platforms like, like yourself. Um, do you anticipate more of that um, coming down the road? Yeah, I mean, I think actually regulation is a, a very good thing in the crypto space. It's just in the early days of any regulation, I think what normally you would see is they go to an extreme and then pull back to a, to a middle ground. So at the moment, we're hearing sort of the extreme voice. Um, and the sort of the concept is that everything is a security, so therefore we will regulate everything as a security. Now, in reality, everything isn't a security. I mean, for example, a stable coin, I don't think anyone could argue a stable coin is, is a security. And for, for your listeners, in case anyone doesn't understand what a stable coin is, it is simply a, a cryptocurrency token that is linked to fiat currencies. So that the two things are they don't have a an opportunity for gain in their own right unless that fiat currency has a gain in it in its own right. But fiat currency today can earn very little returns on your investment, whereas stable coins, through various methodologies, through you know, all these new exciting protocols that are being developed, can actually earn quite a lot uh, of return on those assets. You could see quite comfortably a ten, maybe a fifteen percent return by effectively saving your digital currency in a stable format compared to say putting fiat currency into a bank. So the whole issue of regulation, it's going to be constantly on people's lips and, and constantly a concern, but I don't think of it as a concern. I just think of it as a little bit of how big is your chest compared to my chest? You know, you're having a little sort of fight at the moment, who's going to win the, the, the war in, in relation to regulation, but it is a good thing. But it shouldn't hamper this metafy, this whole concept of earning, because actually, I think stable coins will become the core, core driver for actually earning. When we're talking about people investing in stable coins, we're, we're not really talking about the same thing as someone who's investing in, say, you know, the yen or something like that, because they're, you know, they have a, um, you know, a view on yield. How risky? Is it in effect when you're, when you're putting a portion of your actual sort of investment capital into a stable coin, how does that stack up versus say the traditional, 
um, Forex market where you're dealing with very reputable, highly rated, triple A rated custodians and, and big banks in the city of London and people like that. There, there is no denying that it is more risky. I mean, absolutely. You, you can't, on the one hand, say that um, a, a, a currency that is backed by a central bank is less risky than, um, than a, a currency that is backed by a private institution effectively. So that's what most stable coins are. They're actually private institutions that have come up with a concept to link it to a, to a fiat currency. And there is a lot of debate still about whether or not, um, the stable coins are really backed by that particular asset that they say, and particularly with the, um, with the tether USDT, that uh, there's still, even though they've been audited and, and constantly reviewed, there is a lot of debate. If they've got fifteen billion dollar of market cap, do they really have fifteen billion dollars worth of of U.S. dollars sitting behind there? There are others, USDC, for example, which I think people are more comfortable with in terms of that they really are backed. But nevertheless, there is still an institution between you and the central bank. You know, so there is another, there is definitely another layer. So with that additional layer of risk comes additional layer of opportunity for, for earning money. So what can you earn with a dollar today? 3%, 4% absolute maximum, I would guess. Whereas with the stable coin, you could easily be earning 10 to, to say 15%. So there is an extra element of risk, but I think this again goes back to the, um, the question of regulation until regulation really starts to come down onto stable coins themselves, um, there is going to be an extra level of, of risk. I mean, right now, for example, um, in the UK, as I'm sure you're familiar with, there are certain protections and, and guarantees. If you put your money into a bank, you have a certain amount of, of protection. I think that protection today is £85,000 in, in one single bank account. Now, those type of protections don't exist in, in, in cryptocurrency. And if stable coins become a sort of de facto uh, form of money, then you expect regulation will start to apply those same type of conditions to institutions that are issuing stable coins. And once they've been approved, you'll have the same type of protection. So I think stable coins are actually a, a very important part of the, the development of cryptocurrency because people can understand it. They really, you know, it's relatively straightforward. There's, there's a digital version of some money here and it's not going to fluctuate any more than the pound fluctuates to the euro. And I can spend it in a very confident manner that I know that the price today is pretty much the same price as it was yesterday, give or take, you know, a few um, basis points. So I think they are very important, but I also do think before people jump onto that bandwagon of cryptocurrency stable coins, regulation will be a very important part to give people confidence that I'm not just going to lose it tomorrow due to some entity that I've never heard of. I didn't really understand going under. So I think that's probably still five or six years away, but it is definitely coming. Is it, and I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but is it a case that stable coins are a little bit like a, a relatively highly rated corporate bond? Uh, you're getting the same kind of yield as you're getting from a corporate bond. And that as the regulation comes in and as confidence grows mm. around that environment, the actual yield opportunities can come down for the investor because there's just going to be more money involved and there's going to be a perception, you know, I'm thinking about five years from now that it's actually less risky at that stage. Yeah. But th there's an interesting, um, human psychology, I think here at play in that you're 100% right in that five years down the line, the yield opportunities in a, in a stable coin will become lower as they become more readily acceptable as a form of money. But I think there's a human psychology that says as something becomes safer or, or, or more regulated, people just move into a slightly different environment to, to still go back into that risk level. Um, I mean, for example, if you think in sports, for example, they will introduce new safety measures in a car to try and protect the driver, but they then introduce some other measures that the car manufacturers to try and get around that. So introduce seat belts. Okay. We can go faster now, or you, um, in sports, we introduce, um, head guards or, or different pads. So people will just hit you harder. And I think there's a human psychology that there's a certain amount of risk people are prepared to accept. So as that comes down in, in stable coins, which I think will then become a de facto form of, 
of payment for people, something else will just take its place. You know, something else will, will pop up and, and people will with that, you know, who are prepared to take that little bit of extra risk, we'll move into that. I don't know what that will be yet, but you know, something else will take its place. And I wanted to move on to central bank digital currencies now. I mean, these, these are, to me, it almost feels a bit like central banks have woken up to the fact that the cryptocurrency sector is expanding rapidly. And it's almost like their me too moment. I want to be involved. I don't want to, I don't want to be left out. I want to exercise some level of control over this market by just starting to issue my own um, digital currency as well. Is that the reality of the situation or, or, or is there more to it to, than that? I think it depends on the country you're, you're, you're dealing with. Um, my, my knowledge of deep knowledge of any individual project is relatively low in that most governments are, are keeping that you know, pretty clear and close to themselves. So for example, in the UK, if you read the UK's website on digital currencies, it doesn't tell you anything whatsoever other than they've got work groups and, and various other things on the go. But so I think each country is looking at it differently, but I think you are right in that they have woken up to the fact that people don't tend to use cash anymore. I mean, I do personally, cause I'm a 57 year old who's, who's quite likes having cash in my wallet, but you know, my children, my sons and daughters, they don't use cash. They go out using, a, uh, they don't even use a payment card anymore. They just use their phone. So I think all banks have to wake up to this, that you no know, people are not using cash. Actually, cash is also probably the worst thing that any um, central bank can have in terms of tracking money flows as to who's spending it on what, et cetera. So the idea that people are moving more digital naturally, banks tend to want more control, not less control. In some countries, they, they really do want more control. China, I think, is a perfect example of that. So the idea that they could issue their own digital currency, which might remove the, um, the lack of control they have over cash, the two things are coinciding. So they're not having to fight this one. Um, often, you know, governments have to fight the idea that they're going to bring in a, a new measure to control you or control your activities. Whereas here, actually people are moving towards that anyway. So the banks say, well, if they're moving this way, what can we do to, to take advantage of this? So there's something like, I don't know, a hundred different banks looking at this right now. But as you know, you know, banks, they move incredibly slow. Central banks, this is, they move incredibly slow. So I wouldn't anticipate a major shakeup in the next five or, or even 10 years, but there's definitely going to be an introduction of central bank digital currencies soon. You mentioned China um, and, and their digital, digital yuan. Um, do you think that if they throw enough resources and muscle behind this and try to get it used more widely um, outside China, say in, in the Southeast Asian markets, that that actually could become like one of the leading digital currencies. Do you think it gives them the opportunity to maybe steal a march on the US dollar if they can get something like that established and being more widely used, um, certainly within their sphere of influence in the next few years? I think that's probably what China wants. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I, I can't get into the heads of the ruling party, but I think that's what China wants. If you, if you go back to the conversation we just had about stable coins, I don't know what the exact number is, but probably 95% of all stable coins are linked to the dollar. You know, it, it's a dollar based stable coin. There are a few alternatives, but pretty much everybody is using the dollar. So even as the world is going cryptocurrency or digital currencies, everything is still pegged to the dollar. And I think China has long um, been arguing against the sort of the dominance of the dollar on the global stage, the US government or any government can use the dollar as a as a tool to whip Chinese companies with. You know, we can put you on a sanctions list and how do we do that? Well, you just won't be allowed to, you know, transact in the dollars or whatever. So I think for China, that is one element. And I think you could also say the same for most Asian countries that are looking at this. The the so their dependence on the dollar and their ability to transact internationally is so heavily controlled by you know US monetary policy around the dollar. So for China, I think that is one of the, the, the reasons. But I also um, go back to 
the fact that digital currency is actually more trackable than cash or, or even most any, any other transactions. Uh, many people in the digital currency sphere probably think that, you know, you cannot trace who this transaction you know, was from. But in an environment of, of central bank digital currencies, there is no environment that I can see where you can do a transaction of, say, more than $100 where that is not being tracked back to its its original source. So you have to go through KYC procedures, you have to um, prove source of funds. And for a country like China, which you know, prides itself on, on really having a, a controlling interest over its people, knowing every single transaction that goes from one person to another person can you know, offer so many benefits. I mean, it probably removes bribery from the government institutions. It can remove um, all of that street trading that never used to pay any taxes, et cetera. So, you know, for a country like China, it's it's a, a wonderful um, opportunity, not just to, to beat the dominance of the dollar, but also you know, get some control over things it currently has very little control over. We at the Armchair Trader obviously do, um, we, we cover Forex markets and we, we write about um, Forex for active traders. Um, who have been busy trading the differences in, in a wide range of different currency markets. Do you think that when we see the central bank digital currencies coming onto the market, do you think a, a, a similar market will exist for traders to trade the relative value between these as well? Is that something we might see evolving or is it going to look completely different? Um, I, I haven't really given that too much thought, but what I know right now is that there is no central bank digital currency that's paying any form of interest, for example. So they're all just perfectly pegged to whatever the, the local currency is. Whereas the local currency, if you're holding it, you can actually, you know, if you're a trader between trades, at least you've got your money sitting somewhere earning, even if it's a few basis points a day, you know, there's still some, whereas the CB, um, the central bank digital currencies, I, I don't like the acronym, it's hard to say. Um, they are not paying any interest. Uh, they're all not talking to each other yet. Um, they all want their own little bit of dominance. So I think probably in the Forex sphere, markets always appear, but right now there is no obvious market how you could actually make any money from this. I guess with one exception in that the transactional cost should be less. You, know, you see all sorts of reports that say, you know, international transaction costs would be reduced by billions of dollars if we all moved into, you know, the central bank currencies. But I don't think that's a key driver right now. The volume is so small that that's not going to make any difference. So as a Forex trader, I think it would be an interesting market to keep an eye on. But in my mind, I can't see how you could actually make really any money out of it right now, other than, as I say, you know, as a form of trading with slightly lower fees. So really the main motivation, if you're a central bank and you've got your working group set up um, for your, for your um, central bank um, digital currency, it's really all about transparency, control, and ultimately, if you're not, uh, well, if you're a dollar pegged economy, maybe another road out from underneath that dependence on the Federal Reserve. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I just don't see a, a, an economic model um, that doesn't include um, central bank digital currencies in the next 20 years. Every single central bank eventually will have its own currency. Um, they will have the Bitcoin or whatever we're going to call the UK um, version of it. Um, and they will be traded in the same way. But right now, it is just 100 different markets looking at their own ways of how can we introduce this in a, in a way that's best for us, us being that individual country. I don't think there is any real... Um, international experience. If you look at the IMF, um, they watch it, but they're not really influencing it whatsoever right now. And they're, they're just curious to see how this is going to pan out. But I think it's a matter of control. That That's the ultimate gain from a, from a central bank currency. And as you say, um, move away from the dominance of the dollar if you're in that type of environment. Where does that leave countries like El Salvador, which obviously generated a lot of headlines when they said they were going to be adopting Bitcoin? Because obviously Bitcoin you know, that, that's a stronger, that's a, it's a, it's a stronger currency and an alternative to the U S dollar. Do you see what countries like that doing, doing more of the same, or is, is that just an experiment, a one-off experiment? I think it was a one-off experiment for Bitcoin, but I can't imagine other countries, you know, adopting a digital currency of some nature. 
Um, but Bitcoin, it got the headlines. According to El Salvador, they, um, they've introduced, um, or they've increased their tourism by, I don't know, tenfold or something, and they've become a, you know, a global um, news story. So I guess there's some benefits. Also for uh, the individual, um, I mean, if you are, for example, in Turkey today and you've got 80% inflation, you know, at the end of the year, your money is worth almost half of what, you know, what it was at the beginning of the year, et cetera. So there is still an attraction for countries to introduce another form of currency that even though Bitcoin is incredibly volatile, say, compared to the dollar or, or, or sterling or the yen or something, it's still quite an attractive value proposition because if you're in Turkey, you know it's going down 80%. You know, that's the fact. It's, it's not going up 80%, it's going down 80%. Whereas at least Bitcoin went down 50% or 70% even, but it could go up 70%. So, you know, for some people, at least that's a better bet than just putting your money in your own local currency that you know is going to be worth a lot less. So I don't think it's El Salvador will be the last country to to go down this path. They may not choose Bitcoin, but they may choose some other coin that you know ha has emerged um, that is a more stable environment than, say, Bitcoin. Because I think Bitcoin, going back to the opening statement, most people invest in Bitcoin purely as an investment opportunity. You know, very few people spend Bitcoin. Um, they may spend other currencies, but very few are actually spending Bitcoin. So I think, in reality, El Salvador went a bit early, but still, you know, it was it was an experiment that was worth doing, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if other countries do try and copy the model, but with a lot of improvements. And uh, just finally, uh, the time of recording this podcast, uh, we, we've just had the the um, famous Ethereum merge. Yes, uh, I just wanted to get your your view on on that. Whether that's good good for Ethereum, good for the wider crypto industry. I think this. Actually, I'm quite surprised by how the market has reacted to the Ethereum merge and that obviously markets always price in an expectation and they obviously priced in a success. So when Ethereum had its successful merge, there was no uptick, you know, nobody said congratulations. And then the going back to the conversation on, on the regulation, the SEC suddenly said, ah, oh, well, now that you've moved to proof of, of stake rather than proof of work, you're now a security. So actually the price... Yeah, you know, was was hit quite hard. Now that will recover itself. That's just you know a market reaction. So, but I think it was very important um, in that um, the proof of work um, concept. Uh, and for those who who don't understand the difference between the two, proof of work is effectively a whole set of computers doing very complicated calculations to earn a, a fee to have the uh, the right to approve a transaction effectively. And and we know that there's all sorts of environmental impacts from those computers doing all of that work. Um, and that was one of the major criticisms that most you know, high street newspapers would have against cryptocurrency, the, the, the wastage of energy. Now, Ethereum has moved from that proof of work um, concept to a proof of stake, where it's very simple. If you own a lot of tokens, you have a right to effectively approve certain transactions. There's still some complicated calculations going on in the background, but nothing like, and they estimate that the energy reduction is you know, more than 99% um, reduction in, in actually making that work. And it also makes it um, more realistic for average people to be part you know, partaking in this um, environment. If you wanted to be in a proof of um, work concept, you had to really have very powerful computers that could do uh, calculations that the average computer couldn't do. So again, most people were out of uh, out of um, they're not involved in the process. Whereas a proof of stake, this is goes back to how do I earn money to some degree? You can pool your assets together with other people for a proof of stake, so that there's one very large stake, and then you can share in those rewards. And the way that the blockchain works, you don't even have to move those assets into one place. You just have to connect them through through the blockchain. So I think the proof of stake will give more people opportunity to earn that don't have the resources to go out and compete with the Bitcoin miners, etc. I think it is good for the environment. And the fact that it went off without any hitch, and let's remember something like 50% of all cryptocurrencies are on the Ethereum you know, blockchain. I think it was very, very important. Um, as I say, I'm a bit surprised the market didn't react more positively, but I think that was because of the SEC. Um, but no, I think it is a major step forward for cryptocurrency.
do you think that that, that this could further burnish uh, Ethereum's reputation that, and it will become the, the, the market leader, the, the industry leader ahead of Bitcoin? I think eventually, but Bitcoin, I, it doesn't really have a purpose other than as a digital asset that to, to make money off. So I wouldn't be surprised if Bitcoin, I mean, let's remember Bitcoin only, there's only going to be 21 million of them and there's something like 19 million of them already minted. So there's only 2 million left. And as cryptocurrency becomes more and more popular, I don't see Bitcoin as a value proposition reducing because it's such a limited supply. And if you say it's worth 50,000, it's worth 50,000 because it hasn't got anything underlying it. There's no, you know, there's no you know, physical asset that says this. Whereas Ethereum is very different in that Ethereum actually earns fees from the fact that there are so many transactions on its chain because that's where most of the coins sit. So I think Ethereum becomes sort of the big daddy of all all tokens eventually, but I don't think it will outpace Bitcoin as a value just because of a very different nature and why people own it. But I, I think this um, changeover from Ethereum just slowed down all the competitors from taking its space. And I, I, I think as an, as an owner of a currency, um, Bitcoin, you can just put, put your finger in the air and just guess what price it's going to be. Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? Whereas with Ethereum, you know, I feel that you know, the, there's only a positive path forward now because more and more companies will be you know, confident of using that chain, knowing that, that it works. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the podcast today, Austin. And, and um, very quickly before we close, if anyone's interested in using Choice, where, they, where can they find out more about what you do okay so i mean it's very simple just choice.com it's very easy choice is spelt with an s um and on the website you can easily download our application um, our application as i mentioned is it's used in seven 170 countries and we've got more than seven hundred thousand users uh, and one other thing if you don't mind me just plugging one thing is we also do a b2b version of our application so if, if there are companies that are really interested in providing the type of services we do we have a version that you can basically download into your own application and get into crypto straight away without all the hassle and all the licensing problems that go with it well thank you very much indeed um, for coming on today all right thank you Stuart. it was a pleasure you've been listening to the armchair trader podcast make sure you visit our website www.thearmchairtrader.com for your daily dose of financial markets news and sign up to our free newsletter there